morning is coming out of 1 Timothy. Uh, the title is Contentment. Um, I want you to ask yourself this question. I don't think you can answer it off the top of your head. Is Christ enough for you? I think that's a question that you really have to dig deep and you really have to ask yourself and pray about. Is Christ really enough for me? I have been struggling with that question personally. Um, I think in life because many times when we go through life, we find that we find, find ourselves a little discontent in certain areas of our life. And there's lots of areas, but I keep thinking to myself, well, when this happens, then I'm going to be satisfied or happy. Or maybe next year, you know, when I'm here, then things are going to be better. And I'm asking myself, why can't I be content right now? Why can't I be content today? So I wonder, what are some areas of your life that are causing you discontent? Where Christ is not enough for you? What are you not satisfied? What is keeping you up at night? There's lots of areas of, uh, uh, in our lives that, that cause discontent. Like relationships, for example. You might be in a relationship right now. Maybe it's a, a, a marriage or a friendship. And you're not really happy with it. It's causing you discontent. Or maybe you would like to be in a relationship. You're single and ready to mingle. And you, you know, you're not finding that right one. Maybe you have a bad work environment. Like we talked about last week, a bad boss. You should hear that message if you did it online. What, is it, what do you do when you have a bad boss or a, a bad teacher? Um, what about if you're in school? You have a roller coaster of emotions going on. <coughs> Lots of things changing. Are you discontent with school or work? And how about finances? There's just too much month at the end of your money. You've been there? Maybe you're there now, right? And there, there's discontent. Like, I don't have what I want to have. Or time. How many of you are just so busy, running, going, going, going all the time, and you just are not happy with the time that you don't seem to have. Or maybe it's your self-worth, as we sang today. The voices in your head are telling you something that's not true, and you're not happy. Or you look in the mirror and you say, I don't like what I see, or I'm still never going to be satisfied with my weight, or, or whatever it is that, that, that you have going on, or a habit that you just can't seem to stop, an addiction that you would like to not be an addiction. What is your area of discontent? You wouldn't be human if you didn't have something going on in your life where you were feeling like it's not great. I would like this to go away. How many of you have something in your life that you would just like to see be better, be, be happier about? All right, be content, find peace, sleep at night. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a dreamer. I believe there's an answer for you today. I believe the Word of God is going to bring you something that's going to bring you comfort and truth. Um, there's contentment if you desire it. So we have to look into the Word of God and find out where that contentment is. And, and we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I told Jamie when I came to this scripture as we've been going through, well, we're going to finish up 1 Timothy next Sunday, um, which would be about 22, I think, messages we spent going verse by verse through this book. I would much rather not preach on this topic because, as I told you, I struggle with this. This is an area of, of, of this is tough for me to struggle with this. I, I, I had a hard time with this. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 10, you're going to see what it says in here. But if you would, stand in reverence uh, for God's Word. This is um, verses 3 through 10. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. He is puffed up with a conceit and understands nothing. Then I'm going to skip down to the part. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing... With these will we be content. But those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation 
into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. Let's pray. God, this word is, uh, it hits a nerve with many of us because for many of us, we are concerned about our money situation. But God, as you will teach us today, it's not the money, it's our heart. It's where we're at with you and our relationship with you. Is Christ enough for us? God, help us to answer that today. Help us to see a solution to our problem of discontent. And may we find true contentment and true gain in your love and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. So, as we look at verses 3 and 4, as I looked at those verses, it was talking about people who were religious that were finding great gain because they were godly. It's 2,000 years ago written, but yet today we still see the same thing going on in our world. Do we not? People, religious people, gaining greatness or, or, or gaining uh, financial gain because of their godliness. Preying on the weak people who desire to be wealthy and healthy. And they're telling them what they want to hear so that they'll open up their wallets. Right? They have ministries on television. They write books. They do events. And they all do it to, to generate money for themselves. That's what verses 3 and 4 is talking about. Paul is saying, that's not the means to gain. Don't use this godliness as a way to, to make lots of money for yourself. I was laughing at uh, this movie, an old movie that you may have seen before, based on a John Grisham novel called The Rainmaker, and it's about this lawyer. And this young lawyer is trying to help this woman, um, this older woman, um, come up with a will for, for um, you know, when she passes on. And she wants to give all her money to this TV evangelist that she likes so much because she thinks, as he said, her, his current jet is getting old and he needs a new one because he's got to get the, the gospel out to the whole world. And it was obviously making fun of, of TV evangelists that do that kind of stuff. And um, we see that, unfortunately, that, that people are making promises to, to make money um, to naive people for their own gain. But what Paul says here is godliness, that's not a means to your financial gain. But rather, godliness with contentment, that is the gain. In other words, money is not going to bring you joy. Contentment <laughs> is going to bring you joy. Being satisfied with what you have today. In fact, if you love money more than God, he actually tells us that's going to destroy you. Verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Right? I've told this... Um, joke or, or this thing before I was joking many many years ago when I was taking up the offering and praying for the offering at a different church and I said you know I misquoted this verse you know I said um, the love of or I said money is the root of all evil that's usually how it's misquoted money is the root of all evil so put it in the basket when it comes by <laughs> but that's not what the scripture says the scripture says the love of money what's in your heart how you think about money, how you act towards money. That's what destroys you. Jesus had an encounter with a very rich young man. And in, uh, in the, the story is recorded in three different Gospels. This very wealthy young man came to Jesus with, with this really big question that must have been pondering him, or, or maybe it was just a pride in his heart that he thought he was going to get the answer that he wanted to hear. And the question was, um, am I good enough to go to heaven? That's really what the question was that he asked Jesus. And uh, Jesus asked him, well, did you, did you, do you obey the Big Ten? I like to call them the Big Ten. The Ten Commandments? And he went and listed through them, you know, and they, he was, you know, prideful. He said, yeah, I did. But then Jesus says this in Luke 18, verse 22. 
He says, well, one thing you still lack, young man. Sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you're going to have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Boy, that, that rich young man must have just laughed his head off. Yeah, right. Like, I'm going to give up all that I have and follow you, a poor rabbi. Why would I do that? And when he heard this, then it says he became sad because he was extremely rich. He didn't like the answer Jesus gave. And Jesus said, seeing that he becomes sad, said, hmm, how difficult is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven? Now you probably don't think you're rich, right? I mean, I'm just assuming. You don't think you're rich. I, I, I think that's pretty safe to say in America. Most people don't think they're rich. Let's just say, because I'm a math teacher, I did the math. Let's just say you make $9.45 an hour, the minimum wage here in Michigan. Am I right? Is that the minimum wage? And you make that 40 hours a week. You, you put in your 40 hours a week, you do that 52 weeks a year, and I take out the 20% for taxes. You will make $15,724.80 a year. Now, if you make $15,724.80 a year in, in, in America, People will think, whoa, that's like that's below the poverty line. You want to know what? Let's randomly pick 100 people in the world, put them all in one room, and you're the seventh <coughs> richest person in the room. Go shovel a couple driveways this uh, winter, and you might move up to number six. That's how wealthy Americans are. Yet we think we're poor. But that's the reason why I think many Americans are walking away from God. They're not following God. They don't need Him because they're content with what they have. And if they feel any discontent, they just go buy themselves a new pair of shoes, a new car, a new boat, a new house, and that will make them happy again. So I wonder this morning, is money your solution to being content? When you don't feel like things are going your way, or you're not happy with life, does money solve the problem for you? Or is Christ enough for you? That's why you got to really think and pray before you answer that question. By the way, I don't really believe that Jesus was saying to all of us, sell all you have, be poor, and follow me. I think he was using that specific example because that's the problem with rich people. I think God's Word teaches us that we are to use the money that we have wisely. In fact, it calls it, we are to be good managers, good stewards of everything that God has given us. Our money, our time, all of it. And when we do that well, when we manage our wealth well, He says, we'll be content. When you take care of what God has given you, you'll be content. I take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Allison was talking about sowing into a project that could make a difference in a person's life, in many people's lives. Paul writes to this church in Corinth in verse 6, he says, Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency, that's the same word for contempt, in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. When we live with an open hand, when we um, give as God has led us to give, and we do it cheerfully, we will find contentment in all things, in all times. We do good works with our money. Paul told Timothy at the end of chapter 6, in verse 17, he says, this is what rich people should do. And honestly, I think this is what all Americans should do, because I think we're all rich, when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be prideful, haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is truly life. Now after all that, maybe I should call for the offer. 
<laughs> oh, she was going to go over and take the offer. <laughs> but I would never intentionally manipulate you to give to God's word. That must come from your heart, a right heart. But have you ever asked yourself this question, how much money is enough? When's it going to be enough? Like, when am I going to have enough money where I'm going to be happy, or I can retire peacefully? You ever think about that? I think about that a lot. You know, how much is enough? When is it ever going to be enough? Well, I believe the answer to this question is never going to be answered by an amount. There's never going to be an amount. You could ask a millionaire today, do you have enough money? And they probably will say no. And then we think, well, if we had that money, we'd be happy. No, we won't. It's not an amount. It never is. You can lose sleep all you want for that fixed amount. It's not going to give you sleep. No amount ever satisfies. It always comes back to our heart. Is your heart right when it comes to money? If your house burns down, if the stock market goes belly up, you lose your job, are you going to be content? Or does it depend on what you have? I think it should depend on your heart. I think that's why the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 13.5. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now that word content there is a little bit different in that it means to put a wall up, to defend yourself to guard, to barrier off, to ward off. In other words, you have to guard your heart from the love of money. It's not going to come naturally. What comes naturally for us as people is to be selfish and hoard all we have. Love money, love what I can give for myself. But to guard your heart from the love of money, well, that's, that's tough, especially living in America, because our society tells you, you deserve it. You deserve it. You, you, you need a new something, something, right? And young people are taught this. Maybe you're teaching your kids this. You can have whatever you want. You put your mind to it. You work hard with it. You can have whatever you want. But are we teaching them to be content with what they have right now? Are we teaching them to guard their hearts from the love of money? Sure, work hard. Strive to be your best. Shoot for the stars. But guard your heart from the love of money. We need it to survive, but we don't need it to thrive. We need money to survive, but we don't need it to thrive. And Jesus said the most famous, some of the most famous words that he did ever say. He said, where your money is, your heart will be too. Jesus understood this. He tied these things together. Your money and your heart. They're interconnected. Is your heart right when it comes to money? You can only answer that. I can't answer that for you. But I believe if you can find contentment with money, it's probably because your heart is right and you will find contentment everywhere else in life. That's why all these verses that we find in the Bible that talk about contentment, they deal with money because Jesus said money and your heart, they go together. So maybe you're convinced now, maybe the scripture has, has shown you that it's important to be content with what you have today, not tomorrow, not in the next year, not whenever, but now, today. It's a heart issue. You get that. All right, fine. Pastor Matt, move on. Quit talking about money. Come on, let's go. What do I do now? How do I get content? How do I make my heart right? Well, it comes back to that question. Is Christ enough for you? Is Christ enough for you? Because if anything else becomes more important than your, in your life, if any person becomes more important than Jesus, you won't find contentment. You'll never be happy. Completely. You'll never be at peace. The number one command is to love God with all your heart. Right? And not love anyone else more than God. Is Christ enough for you? One of the most popular verses in the Bible is Philippians 4.13. <clears throat> My wife likes to say it all the time. I can do all things. What's the rest? Through Christ. Through Christ who strengthens me. That's right. And people will apply that in their lives, especially athletes, right? Um, 
people who like to, to do great things, right? They want to do great things for God. There's nothing wrong with that. But they apply this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can move mountains if God is on my side. Right? That's kind of how it's applied. Well, I'm here to teach you that based on the context of this verse, God is really saying, contentment is possible through him who strengthens you. I can do all things really means I can be content in every area of my life because Christ is enough for me. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. I can do all things really means I can be content in every area of my life because Christ is enough for me. Listen to it. Philippians 4. Paul's writing to the, the Christians in Philippi. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity and that actually means to give financially. They had given to him financially to help him in his ministry. And they didn't have an opportunity to. But they were concerned for him. And he says this. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. Like I'm not, I'm not in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. Ooh. Boy, when you hear the secret, don't you want to let, you know, ooh, what's the secret? Come on, Paul, tell us the secret. What's the secret here to being content? I've, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hungry, abundance and need. The secret is this. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The secret to contentment is knowing that Christ is enough for you. That's the secret. That's what he means when he says, I can do all things. Paul had a mission in life. You may think the mission in his life was to, to share the gospel all over the Mediterranean Sea. He traveled three times, three big mission trips. He was imprisoned. He, he went through the gamut. I mean, stoned. Uh, I mean, people thought he was dead several times over. You thought Paul was a cat, man. He had like nine lives. Like, he just kept going and going and, and spreading the gospel and starting churches and raising up elders. And you would think that was his mission in life. But you know, he shared his mission in life in Philippians 3.10. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That was Paul's true mission in life. That he could know Christ and the power of his resurrection. To know forgiveness and to know the abundant life that comes from being forgiven. Let me ask you this question. Are you a Christian? I know it seems like a really simple answer, right? But if you answer yes, yeah, I'm a Christian, that means you have admitted to God that you have disobeyed Him. You've missed His mark of perfection. You're a sinner, is what sin means, to miss the mark. If you're a Christian, then you have not tried to justify your sin in any way. You don't look to God and say, well, I, I've been a good person my whole life. You're going to certainly accept me. No. You're a real, if you're a real Christian, you don't think that way. You pray to God and said, please forgive me, God. I know that the only way that I can be forgiven is by the blood of Jesus. And you confess that Jesus is truly the Son of God. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose from the dead three days later. And he's alive today and he sits at the right hand of the Father. See, that's what real Christians believe. I think there's a lot of fake Christians in America. Three out of four people identify with being a Christian in America. But I guarantee you, when they are pointed to those questions, those beliefs, they don't really believe Jesus is the Son of God. Are you still a Christian? If you were taught something else, maybe it was a baptism that saves you or, or some other belief that, that you think saves you because... You, you grew up in this kind of church or whatever. Well, it's not too late. You can believe the truth. You can be saved by grace alone, through faith alone. You just have to pray to God. You just have to ask. You can do that anywhere, anytime, any place. But when you do that, 
and you become a Christian, that's really just the beginning. It's not the whole gospel. <clears throat> it's not time to give an invitation, which many pastors do when we talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is just the beginning. Forgiveness starts off this wonderful life that you can have in Christ, the abundant life he talks about. Because he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's when life really starts. When you have the Holy Spirit in you, empowering you to live life forgiven. We must have the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. We must live in the power of the resurrection of Christ. If anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. The old passed away, the new has come. Are you living like a Christian should live? That's really my question for you this morning. Are you living like a Christian should really live? Do you pray every day like David prayed? Search me, O God, know my heart. See if there's any grievous way in me. <clears throat> Do you pray that prayer on a daily basis? Search my God, know, search me, know my heart, God. Try me, know my thoughts. The way I think, the way I act, is there anything that grieves you, God? That's a deep prayer. And when Christians live every day praying that prayer and expecting grace to fix those areas that, that God reveals to you when you pray that prayer, search me. And it's not search my heart and, and I sure hope that he doesn't find anything. <laughs> it's search my heart and you know what? You're going to find something because I know me. Now give me grace to fix it. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's the gospel. Christians consume the word of God. The Bible's not dusty. Your Bible's falling apart because you're not. The pages are all over the place. It's highlighted. You're underlining stuff because you're in the word of God because you need that more than you need real food. That's what it means to live like a Christian. And you meet regularly with other Christians because they build you up and they encourage you and you get to pour into them and build them up. That's why we meet every Sunday and lots of times in between. And Christians trust God regardless of what happens in life. Yesterday I had lunch with a friend of mine who this December, it will be one year since he lost his wife to cancer. And he still doesn't get it. And he never will. And he's broken. And he's hurting. But he looked at me across the table and he said, Matt, I still trust God. I still trust him. That's a Christian. Are you living like a Christian? Christians need Jesus every single day to strengthen them. And if you are living like a Christian, I bet you found contentment. Because that's the only way we can be content. If Christ is enough for you, and you don't need anything else. If Christ is enough for you, everything else is just icing on the cake, as I say. But Christ has to be enough for you. And I just want you to know this. You'll never arrive at complete contentment. You might have it today. Because Christ is enough for you today. But you're going to wake up tomorrow, and you might lose your job. Or you, you know, your, your money might run out, or a relationship might end. And you know what? You're going to need Christ all over again tomorrow and the next day. But I want you to be encouraged by these words in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have Jesus, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. So what do you do when you're broken and you're feeling discontent? You draw near with confidence to the throne of grace and you receive mercy and you find grace to help in times of need. That's what you do. This morning as we prepare for our offering, as we prepare to sing our final song, just meditate on that question. Is Christ enough for me? Is Christ enough for me?